Okay. Hi, Monica. Hi, Alicia. How are you? Great. How are you? I am doing excellent. Thank you Yay. so much. I'm so excited to get to talk with you um, in this reformed conversations today. Um, for those of you who are watching too, it's, you know, the reform conversations, this is, I think our fourth one now. Um, and the reformed conversations are a chance to kind of give content um, in a, a unique way. <laughs> you can watch it live or watch the video later uh, to folks that are in the education profession and thinking about their career development and career search efforts. So okay. today I'm super excited to have um, a former colleague, I guess, who's now a new co a returning colleague <laughs> in a way. Yes. <laughs> um, Monica Vergara, who is an organizational development consultant. Um, Monica partners with schools and education organizations and educators on kind of the scientific side of talent selection, performance management, and leadership development. So she today in particular is going to be bringing her expertise with the workplace big five personality model to um, to us today, and we're kind of through this video interview today, um, kind of launching our partnership to be able to have Monica bring those services to Ed Plus clients to help with their career discovery and development. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes, but um, I'm excited to hear from Monica today about kind of the science behind personality assessments and, and have her put those things in practical terms for us. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm excited to talk to you and excited to share this um, background and expertise with your clients, whether it's live or via recording. Um, yeah. And hopefully through our partnership. I'm very excited about that too. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I think when I've talked to people a bit about this topic, they've gotten excited <laughs> because they, I think lots of people really enjoy the assessment side of things or, you know, yeah. anything from going to, I think a lot about like going to Cosmo magazine or something and doing one of those quizzes <laughs> that tells you something about yourself. I don't yes. necessarily think that those are, I mean, you can tell us differently, but those might not be super scientific. <laughs> Particularly with um, so many of us in education that are very data driven um, in our work, the idea of having some data to help us understand what career paths we should be on, what, um, things we should be doing to kind of build on our own strengths and things like that is, is really interesting. So um, why don't you first tell us a bit about your work and kind of what it is to be an organizational development consultant? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So first of all, um, I will tell you that my, my background is in industrial and organizational psychology. Um, I got my master's at George Mason University, so the Washington DC area is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so as an industrial and organizational psychologist, I uh, work with both the individual and the organization as a whole, and that's really what I, I truly appreciate about um, that branch of psychology, is the fact that my passion for helping people be in the right job, the right person be in the right job, um, can extend to also um, helping the culture of the organization. Mm. I can influence both um, who gets selected to a particular role and ensure that the person who selected is the ideal person such that the demands of the job are going to fit very nicely with the personality or what that person brings to the table, their strengths and also their challenges. Um, and I can also work with the organization as a whole to be able to influence the culture and to influence the environment that this person is going to be working in. Is that does that make sense? That does, yeah. and that's that's really helpful. And I think, um, uh, as you know, we first met several years ago when I was Chief Talent Officer at DC Prep. Um, and yes. I think 
often people think about personality assessments as like that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like Myers-Briggs assessments and things like that, that people do kind of one-on-one -on -one to understand themselves. But uh, particularly having worked with you um, through the work we did at DC Prep, um, the idea of kind of understanding the kind of one-on-one -on -one side, the individual personality assessments, but also getting to see that work amongst the team um, mm -hmm. and thinking about that from the uh, career development, organizational development side is, is really interesting to me. Again, um, at DC Prep, for those of you who are interested, we uh, contracted with Monica to help us kind of understand a bunch of things, but one particular thing was to understand um, the ideal profile of school leaders as mm -hmm. we continue to grow and to add new um, leaders to the organization, which could then help us think about how we went about hiring and what our selection processes and things like that should look like. Um, what other benefits do you think that educators can get from career assessments? Oh, yes. So, um, definitely, as you mentioned, you know, that I think that there's there's an innate curiosity in all of us to understand ourselves and to gain awareness of how we are put together and what kind of things make us tick and sure. what kind of things will get us out of bed in the morning and why some jobs do that for us and others don't do that for us. Yeah. Um, so I think for not only for educators, but for anyone who chooses to take a personality assessment and, and go on that journey, um, a personality assessment will give you um, insight into, let's call it the building blocks of your personality or sort of the ingredients that make you who you are. And many times we are used to we talk about personality all the time in a very casual way, um, but when you take an assessment, then you gain language, you gain very specific language for referring to qualities that describe you that you may not have had a label for before. Hmm. And just like when you go to the doctor and you are maybe having some, some symptoms and they finally give you a diagnosis and you can sort of hold on to that and kind of run with it and figure out, you know, how you're going to take care of yourself. Um, I feel like having a label for some of your personality qualities can do that for you too. It, it's very empowering then to know, oh, you know what? Um, I now understand that I am um, naturally more reserved than other people. Hmm. And so when I'm in a meeting, this is why I don't typically voice my opinion. Uh -huh. um, and I will only voice my opinion when other people ask me about it. So yeah, just, just really having cool. that frame of reference or understanding, oh, now I understand why Alisa is always so outspoken. Like we're on different poles of the spectrum. And what does that mean in terms of what is my strength? If I'm in a meeting or in a group conversation, what, what does that mean for what I bring to the table? Sure. What does that mean for when I work? Alicia, what are some synergies we can have together? Does that make sense? It does. That's really interesting. And I think that, that what's most interesting for a lot of folks is they, particularly with career-related assessments, they often think, oh, I'm not good at X thing, so therefore um, I shouldn't do X thing. Um, yes. Do you really see them, see the assessments as kind of a deficit-based thing or a... Um, the opposite of deficit, <laughs> you know, like more of a strength-based approach. That, that is a very interesting question because really what it is, and I say this, I've really, I really mean it. There's no right or wrong way of being, you know. Um, basically, we all come with these references. Uh -huh. And what happens is that something that is a strength in a specific context can be a challenge in a different situation. Okay. So it's basically what it is, is understanding um, given what you bring to the table and the environment that you're working in or the context that you are in, then what are going to be the strengths and the challenges? You okay. know, how, 
how when we put you in a specific context, you know, some things are going to become strengths and some things are going to become challenges and how to work around the challenges and how to leverage your strengths. So I think it's a, it's a conversation about putting you in context and really understanding what are going to be the demands of the job or the demands of the situation that you may face um, on a regular basis. Let's say, for example, if you're a school principal and you are seen as the motivator or the, um, the person who, ins who inspires the team to do better, mm. or who inspires the teachers to give all they have every day. Um, so if you have a high score on a trait that we call enthusiasm, then being um, that inspiring, motivating leader is going to come very naturally to you. Gotcha. When you speak, it's going to sound very genuine. It's going to be very natural. Um, whereas if you are low on enthusiasm, you're going to tend to be more formal and reserved and having to play that role of being the, you know, the giving the pet talk is going to seem a bit more forced. Sure. So, so having that sort of understanding can be very helpful for somebody who is transitioning from um, a, a classroom role from being a teacher hmm. to being a leader and then thinking about well I'm going to make this transition these are probably going to be the things that I am going to excel at and these are going to be the things that I may struggle with okay. what does that mean in terms of how I prepare for this role what may be the learning curve and what are some of how can I um, compensate for some of these uh, um, challenges, hmm. maybe by surrounding myself with people in my team who may be, for example, higher on enthusiasm. So if I know I need to really give a speech where I'm going to hit it out of the park, either I rely on this team member to do it for me, or I use this person as a sounding board to really come up with the wording or to prepare for it or to maybe follow, follow in my um, speech right behind me and you kind of do the big finish for me to get people excited something sure. like that right gotcha so gotcha um, that makes sense um, yeah. we just had a um, couple great things and I want to let you do most of the talking but it's a couple yeah. things I want to add in and want to point out too we just had someone join us who's only going to be able to stay with us for a few moments and I, I I think yeah, the information on the assessments um, are really interesting to her, but also for the organization she works at, a, a, a CMO essentially, um, okay. where these things cool. are are interesting Hi. for the organizations as they were as we just were saying a few minutes ago as they were for us at DC Prep. And um, first of all, I just want to ask, um, and I kind of didn't prep you with this particular question initially, but I think it's not too hard for someone like you to answer. Um, we of course know like the Myers Briggs assessments, and yes. you know that's probably I don't know that what you would call that. That's probably the most well known because people can do them at work, but they also have all those shortened versions that you can Google and do online and things like that. Um, you work primarily with the workplace Big Five assessments, and yes. I wonder um, if you can explain what other assessments you think. And this is part of Belinda's question too of kind of. Um, what assessment models you recommend and I know again that you work primarily with the workplace big five so why do you particularly recommend that for um, educa educators and education organizations sure so um, as you can imagine um, if you just do a Google search on personality assessments you will see that there's a key of options out there um, the first thing that you have to determine is what is the purpose you are wanting to use an assessment. Um, so Myers-Briggs and StrengthsFinder, uh, for instance, are assessments that are um, designed and developed and validated for, um, a, for a specific use. And, and that specific use um, can be just raising awareness about how, what are your personality preferences. Um, it can also be, they can also be used for building teams and improving communication between team members. 
uh, but they are not designed for um, helping with decisions like employee selection, hmm. okay? Um, and the reason is that the way that they, the, the results that you get from a Myers-Briggs, um, specifically from a Myers-Briggs assessment, Myers-Briggs will put you in one of two categories. It's like, we know that personality exists in a continuum from, you know, from uh, somebody who is extremely introverted to somebody who is extremely extroverted, right? So introversion, you know, it's, go, it's not like uh, either you're introverted or you're extroverted. There's degrees of, okay. Okay. of extroversion, so to speak. Um, but Myers-Briggs forces you to be in one of those two categories. It's like you're either an introvert or you're an extrovert, and you don't get any sort of gray area. Uh, in between. So many people who take Myers-Briggs, for example, will say, well, my letters, my results say that I'm an extrovert, but I don't always feel like an extrovert, and right. it's, so it don't really fit. And so um, it's because they're missing that, that mid-range. Okay. And so the reason I use the Workplace Big Five profile is because it's a trait-based um, assessment, which which means that it will give you a score for each of 28 traits that make up personality. And it will tell you exactly where along that continuum, say from zero to 100, where along that continuum uh, you fall, your score falls. Okay. And so not only will it tell you, Alicia, you are highly detail oriented you know you have a score of say 45 on a trait that we call um uh detail orientation um but it will also tell you how you compare to the norm so mm -hmm. it will tell you not only are you are you highly detail oriented but you're more detail oriented than about 70 percent of the people out there huh. right Sure. Um, and then I guess if you do this assessment with others in your organization, too, you can kind of see where you fit in each of the traits against other people in your organization. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so I think that an assessment like Workplace that gives you that level of detail um, makes a lot more sense for the work that we do in terms of helping organizations make the right choice when they're mm -hmm. doing hiring decisions or um, doing car making career decisions such as saying, hey, I have this star performing teacher that wants to go into administration. Let's look at, at their profile and see um, how his or her profile matches up with the demands of a school principal job. Um, and so then you can say, oh, look, at, there's, out of these 28 traits, they may struggle on these five traits. Mm -hmm. And is that a decision that you can live with? Can you support them? Sure. The, will there be enough support or learning opportunities or uh, mentorship or um, any sort of developmental yeah. support for this person to be able to excel given these five that may really not clear on what their professional development plan should be. Right, right. Yeah. Of, or you can say the other, the other thing, uh, the opposite, right? You can say of these 28 trades, they really match the role very well on 18. And we have the assistant principal who is actually mm -hmm. going to complement. Look, there's all these things where they may be a good synergy and that's going to work really well. So I'm not so concerned about... Uh, promoting this person um, that I know, say for instance, is not as high on organization because the assistant principal is going to be extremely organized. Sure. And so they may be a support. Complement each other well. A yeah. Right? Yeah, that's great. So, um, so do you think that it's becoming more accepted for education organizations to use more trait-based assessments? Um, and well, let me ask that first, and then I might have a follow-up. 
I think that there's still a lot of education to do around that um, because Myers Briggs and Strengths Finder are very popular, sure. and, they, and they, I'm not putting them down. They they do. There is some. There's something very practical and um, nice about being able to just convey what your personality means in four letters, right? Yeah. So if you say, I'm an INFJ, right. that immediately means something to you if you're like an ENTJ or, you know, so like there's something nice about being able to say that. By the same token, Workplace Big Five can also give you that kind of language. It's sure. going to take a little bit more time for you to learn the the language and get mm-hmm. acquainted with it, but it's that much more nuanced and and powerful when you look at it. Um, gotcha. So it's almost like My- Myers Briggs gives you themes or it gives you this information, but it's kind of packed. Okay. And you have to do a little reading to be able to understand well, what does it mean? Like what 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 does it mean to be an ENTJ? Um, and if you've done enough reading, you you can figure that out. Uh, with with the workplace, you can look at a profile and you have it all broken down. It's almost like an itemized sort of okay. list of the ingredients that make up the person. Yeah, and I'm thinking about this. It's so interesting um, because, well, as you well know, and some of the people who watch this will know too, I um, decided, I guess it was about four years ago now, I decided that I was ready to move on from my role at DC prep and my chief talent officer role and um, went through a bunch of steps to kind of think about what I should do next and kind of um, as many people have heard the story of how I kind of did the traditional search for jobs by like looking at job announcements and all that good stuff but I also um, talked to lots of people like you <laughs> for <laughs> as I like, tried to think about what to do next. And after having done the workplace big five assessment and getting the, um, yeah, the printout of results and then having a session with you to talk through the results. Um, the thing that I'd never really been thinking about, um, stuck out, which was yeah going, you know, I think I, I just remember you at some point saying this, a lot of this leads to the idea of you doing consulting. Um, Yes. (laughs) And I initially thought this must be crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Consulting before. And then there were several other things that happened over the next few weeks and months after that, that kept um, kind of confirming. (laughs) (laughs) So here I am uh, three and a half years later um, consulting, <laughs> essentially co- coaching and consulting. Um, so, but again, interesting for me because I had done Myers Briggs a few times in my life. I think by then, I, I think around that same time I did Strengths Finders, but mm-hmm. none of them really fully helped me understand that that was the career path, like what the yeah. kind of day to day lifestyle I wanted to have in a career should mm-hmm. look like. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what, what about the workplace big five helps you figure that sort of thing out um, to help somebody who's trying to figure out where they go in their career uh, or, yeah. or what, yeah, is it that promotion that they should be considering because it'll take them on X path or um, is it kind of thinking about being in the independent work environment like I am now as a consultant or, what about mm-hmm. the assessment kind of helps you figure that out in a general sense? Well, I, I'm, let's see, let me think about how to approach this. There's, there's um, one of the advantages of using the workplace is that um, it's, it was developed by a husband and wife team, Chris um, Howard and Jane Howard. They are the founders of the Center for Applied Cognitive Studies. Hmm or Centax for short, C-E-N-T-A-C-S. If you look up Centax.com, you'll get their website. Um, Where I'm going with this is they have done quite a bit of research. If you can imagine, they have a database of tens of thousands of assessments Mm. that have been completed over the years. So I purchased my assessments from them. They're the publisher, right? And they get to keep the scores of every assessment that I ever 
um, uh, administer to my clients. And so because of that huge database, they've been able to then um, identify patterns and themes. And so they have um, uh, identified the profile of a typical manager or of a typical leader okay. or a typical salesperson. And so one of the things that, one of the uh, advantages that I have in using the assessment is I can look at your profile and compare it to the profile of a typical leader or a typical manager. And so that gives me a frame of reference for saying, okay, uh, in what ways does Alicia's profile resemble the profile of a typical leader or manager out there? Um, and it gives me another way of engaging you in a conversation to say, hey Alicia, um, for example, Typical leaders tend to be extremely low on need for stability. It's a big umbrella trait that has to do with how you manage stress or how quickly you feel the stress. So typical leaders um, tend to be very low on need for stability. They bounce back from stress very quickly um, or stress doesn't get to them very fast. Um, they move into a problem-solving mode very quickly. Your score on need for stability, I'm, I'm just saying this is an example. Sure. Um, your score on need for stability is higher than the average. So uh, what does that mean for you uh, when you're thinking about entering a leadership role? Um, what kind of preparation do you need to make? Let's talk about your stress management strategies. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about instances where you've had to manage stress, how have they gone well, how have they not gone well? Um, what are some other traits in your profile that can help you compensate or manage your stress better? Um, so it really gives me a very solid framework for, yeah. for looking at someone's profile and engaging them in a conversation that's gonna be very intentional. Sure. Um, and so we, I not only have the, the profile of a typical leader or a typical manager to work with, I also have, hopefully or ideally, I have some information about the role, the specific role that you're going to go into. Yeah. So what we may say is, okay, so typical leaders tend to be really low on need for stability, but, you know, the reality is that um, there's different styles of leadership. Mm -hmm. And perhaps in education, um, we find out that typical leaders tend to be a bit higher in need for stability than, you know, than a corporate manager, say. Okay. Or, so there's also some adjustments to make or there's a conversation to have about, well, what is your leadership style? Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be the typical leadership style. But at least you now have an understanding of like, oh, this is my leadership style. This is how it's different from the average leader out there. <laughs> or this is how a leader in education is different from a corporate manager. Gotcha. And also just yeah. to kind of understand your own tendencies, I guess, and how yeah. your tendencies will fit into this job. Like one that always stands out for me, and I actually need to look back at the assessment that I did with you several years ago. Mm -hmm. But the one that really stands out for me is um, one that was something about recovery time. Um, mm -hmm. and I remember that I had whatever is kind of considered to be kind of slower or low recovery time, which yes. is, you know, I remember when I first heard it, I'm like, oh my gosh, how do I fix that? How do I make myself have better <laughs> recovery time that like type A side of <laughs> how do I make myself perfect kind of thing? And, um, <laughs> as you explained to me, that wasn't a bad thing. It was more of just something to have awareness about for myself that when something um, like intense at work happens that I need some time to, yeah, I can't just necessarily jump from one thing to the next. I need some, yeah. some time to really recuperate in a sense from yeah. those things and then move to the next stage. Um, and I, again, I think about that all the time and think about like building that into my personal calendar and <laughs> things like that because I, yeah, even if I do have to jump from thing to thing, I know that I'm going to at some point this week need like 
recovery time, which is probably on my calendar looks more like self care. <laughs> yes. Um, oh yeah. Yes. So I, I need to make sure that that's built in because that's what my personality requires. And see, so I've not known that right um, from a Myers Briggs or okay. Things Finder. So. Gotcha. The- that level of nuance that we could say, look, your score is called um, rebound time. Rebound, right, okay. Your score rebound time, you have a high score in rebound time. And okay. that means you need more time than the average person to, to bounce back from stress. Okay. Um, and so then we can be very intentional about well, what are some strategies that you can use? Yeah. To support yourself knowing this, knowing this tendency, right? And so just like you said, putting it on my calendar, deciding what are going to be the ways that I'm going to um, take time for myself. And even communicating that with uh, a colleague or a manager so that they know in a crisis situation, you're going to need additional time. Say, for instance, if they have a lower score rebound time, they're going to bounce back faster. Mm -hmm. And they want to engage you in a conversation about um, solutions or what are we going to do about this problem faster than you're ready to do that. Okay. So both of you having the awareness of, you know what, I need that additional time and um, I won't be ready to, to, to brainstorm with you as effectively sure. until I process, you know, yeah. these emotions. Will I have that decompression time? If you give me this additional 15 minutes, you know, right. I'll be right with you. Um, that's just really helpful. And it yeah. builds a lot of trust uh, among colleagues mm. and capacity too. Because um, you may think somebody with high rerun time might be um, deficient in some way. But what actually happens is that people who have high rerun time to do be very thoughtful additional time that you take to to recover from stress is time where you are processing your mm-hmm. thoughts are kind of percolating in your okay. brain and you may come back to the conversation with your manager with a much more rich and sort of um elaborate solution than than she might hmm. you know no, or like a solution that may not have occurred to them before. Yeah, interesting. Because, wow. Yeah. How valuable, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have just one other question, I think, about the um, assessment, in a sense. Before, I want to make sure we talk a little bit about um, what people get out of doing this work with you, in particular. Yeah. Um, and one question that was just sent to me was just understanding, and I think particularly as this area of um, emotional intelligence or EQ gets yes. more um, footing in, you know, in education, but also in other sectors too in the world. Um, how do you see the workplace assessments, um, the workplace big five accounting for emotional intelligence? Mm. That's a very good question. Well, there's a combination of traits um, that we can look at in the assessment that um, tends to have a higher correlation to to high EQ. Mm -hmm. So a person with a certain level of this combination of traits tends to be more likely to have higher EQ. Um, So I can look at those traits and say, and if, you, if that were something that you were specifically interested in, I can, you know, pay attention to those traits in particular and tell you this candidate for leadership role, what is going to be their, their EQ based on the traits I see here, based on the scores that they have. Gotcha. Um, and again, the nice thing about it is we have broken, we have it broken down uh, by traits. So it's a combination of four traits that can predict high EQ. And so we can see which of those traits is going to be uh, a strength and which of those traits are going to be a challenge. So we can say, if this person doesn't have as high EQ, it's because they're not as creative in their thinking or as Uh open to new experiences. So what you may be cautious about is placing them in a school that's going to experience quite a bit of change. Okay. Um, 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, if, you can, if you can place this leader in an, in an environment that's going to be more stable or it's going to have more of a predictable sort of environment, then they'll be better able to manage. Interesting. Uh, so, yeah. Wow, great. So you can kind of do some EQ predictions from yes. the yes. big five assessment. Awesome. So tell us a bit about what you offer to people who do the assessment with you. I think it's... Um, Oh, I don't have that in front of me. I think it's 107 questions, right? Yes. Right. Yes. And it's really easy to take. Um, so it's an online assessment. Um, when somebody uh, is ready to take it, then I actually I send them an email with a link to the website or to, to the actual questionnaire. Um, and I also give them some guidelines. I send an email with a few instructions or guidelines for how to take the assessment, such as... Okay. Make sure that you are in a quiet space. You give yourself enough time to take the assessment. Um, make sure you answer all the questions. Don't leave any questions out. Put yourself in the context of work because this assessment is about your personality in the context of the workplace. So when you answer the questions, try to answer them from the perspective of you at work. Um, and so, so I sent both of those pieces out, and then they complete the assessment, and as soon as they hit submit, then I get an email in my, my inbox with their results. Gotcha. And, and the assessment uh, so takes people, like, up to 15 minutes or so to complete? Yeah, I would say 20 minutes. Okay. Is a good gauge, and if you, even if you need to take a break, you can take a break, log out, okay. log in. Um, and continue so but yeah 20 minutes is usually about the the norm okay for um, and so I typically don't give the assessment results to the person uh, right away uh -huh. I wait until we have our 90 minute consultation uh -huh. and we are like you and I are right now we're face to face sure. and, and you get to look at your results for the first time with me because I think that um, giving you the, uh, the results without me being present is equivalent to a hit and run. You know, I want to, <laughs> I want to have you, you know, look at this information without the right interpretation. Okay. And to start kind of thinking, oh, making assumptions or or incorrect assumptions maybe sure. about what the results may mean. So I'm always very careful to wait until we are together to share the results with you. That's one reason. The other reason is that I like for you to guesstimate what your scores are going to be like mm. on the big five. Yeah. So that, that it's not just me saying, these are your results, this is, these are the scores, but you've had a chance to, once you understand a little bit about what the big five are about, the, the, the description or the definition of each one. Okay. I give you a chance to guesstimate and then, say, and then notice how close your guesstimation is to the actual results. Oh. Um, so that, that's also very powerful. It, it validates, the, it gives a lot of credibility to the tool because uh, a lot of, you know, essentially what you guesstimate tends to be the the results that you get sure. but if it's not then it also gives us a, a way of saying hey what is this difference you know what what were you thinking at this point or why why did you interpret it this way so um gotcha. so that's why i do it that way so we um we talk about the results together during that 90 minute session. I give you some background on just personality in general to help you understand well, what is personality? How do we get, can it really change? And if it changes, how do we make it change or how do we support someone trying to change behavior? Um, what do the scores mean? How do we read the scores appropriately? And, um, and then we go through the, through the report page by page, looking at each of the scores. And um, I help you put each of the scores in the context of the job that you're going to be performing or whatever purpose you may have taken the assessment for. Sure. So, so if somebody is thinking, I'm not really sure what step is next in my career, then right. you kind of help use the results in context with that decision making. Yes. 
else or yes absolutely like gotcha. okay yeah and yes. so um it sounds like you really recommend doing the 90 minute um session with you too the, to really walk through it versus you know again some like with some of these assessments you particularly the ones you can do online you just get a kind of a printout of your results and you read it yourself oh. and things like that and i know you give the printouts of um you get yeah. reports that you get to keep but it sounds like there's really a lot more benefit to getting the time with you too oh absolutely so yes you do get two reports two pdf reports okay. one is called a trait report and that gives you basically your scores let's say all the numbers right all the yeah. scores that you of those 28 traits and then there the other report that you get is called the narrator and that is a written or verbal explanation of what the the numerical scores mean okay it's an interpretation of the score but even I mean, you could argue having both of those pieces, you can make sense of the tool, and you can to a great extent, but the conversation with me makes it that much more, makes it come to life that much more. Sure. Because then I can ask you questions about what role you're trying to engage in or what, what is the question, what is the reason that you took the assessment and we can have a lot more of a targeted or customized conversation yeah. about your results. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow, so that's really great. I mean, I think it's um, a lot of information that you get for the, the in what we're offering to um, Ed Plus clients is yeah. all of that, the, actual assessment, the 107 questions that people do online, the two um, PDFs of the report, and the, uh, the workbook. The workbook, yes. The Workplace Big There's Five. There's the workbook. Okay. <laughs> got the visual there. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and um, the 90-minute session with you, all for $300. It seems like such yeah. a good deal. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's a good deal. Um, and then I should say too, for um, people who decide to do that assessment that are Ed Plus clients and combine it with an Ed Plus coaching package, um, they also we will give fifty dollars off that price. So the actual mm -hmm. cost is just two fifty. Um, and you know, I was thinking about like, well, what's the benefit of doing the 90 minute session with you and then continuing to do uh, career search or development coaching with me? And I think a lot of it really does have to do with the fact that you are really going through the results more mm -hmm. with um, the actual assessment results. And then in sharing the results with me too, we can continue to um, use our coaching sessions to really figure out how our accountability plan, how our next steps in terms of, again, career search or development, um, mm -hmm. and really what the person values and what they really see as their trajectory, how that all matches up with mm -hmm. what the results were from the assessment. Yes, I think it's, it's very powerful that um, um, uh, what your clients can, can have both of us as their partners, you know, yeah. in, in figuring out uh, what their next steps may be or how to be more effective in their roles. Sure. Uh, so it's both having the support of understanding their profile that I can give them and the level of detail that they can get, and then having you to help them along the way. It's not just, here's the results, and do something That's with the that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, sorry for a sec. Excuse me for a second. No, no problem. It's, <laughs> it's that season of so, colds. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, we just got our first huge snowfall here in Grand Rapids. And wow. It's getting to me. Yeah. Um, it's pretty, but it's cold. Well, <laughs> it's beautiful. Yes. Uh, but it's it's uh, an adjustment for the yeah, body. For sure. Um. So, yeah, they can get the support of understanding their, their personality really well and then the support of having you um, walk them through a coaching process and sure. not just say, here's the results and do something with them. They have you as a partner as well. And you and I can communicate um, to help you understand your client's uh, personality assessment or personality yeah. results a lot better. Yeah, I love that. And you know, so when you and I reconnected a couple months ago, and I thought about this as a 
thing I should be offering my clients. Again, I really thought about folks that are um, we can talk through and I can really help them a lot of ways to think about their next steps in their career yeah. and how that integrates with, as I like to call it, their career lifestyle <laughs> and things yeah. like that. Yes. But, um, that so many people are also looking for kind of the data <laughs> in a sense, the scientific side in a sense of what may that pointed to what the next step should be for them. So I'm excited to be able to provide this for folks. And I wonder, you know, we talked a little bit throughout this conversation about the benefits I personally received. Um, yes. And some that um, my previous organization received from using the assessment. Do you have any other um, examples that you want to share as we wrap up today? Of, like the benefits that people have after getting the results, um, people or organizations get? Um, yes, absolutely. So on, on the individual level, um, the assessment, again, provides you with a huge level of detail and awareness about your personality and how you are put together. It's really empowering. I think that people, once they see their results, they, um, they gain a lot of insights about um, patterns of behavior that they, that they may have engaged in or that are part of who they are, but um, how to manage those patterns hmm. to their benefit, right? Sure. How to manage like or if they are getting in the way, how to work with others to help them minimize that. So I think that I've seen the benefits of the tool contribute to less burnout mm. on the job, contribute to making the best possible career decision for yourself. So um, it's meant for some people um, choosing not to go in a leadership role and maybe thinking outside the box and determining, well, what can be a role for me if it's not going to be a school principal role? Hmm. And what other ways can I contribute? Sure. Um, it's also helped people who are already in a school principal role um, and not being as effective as they thought they were going to be, understand what are the reasons why they're not being effective and have then the ability to figure out solutions or figure out approaches and strategies that can, that can support them sure. in improving their, their leadership style. Um, I have uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, powerful examples I had was of a, a school principal and one of my charter school clients um, back in Texas who was a star teacher, a star calculus teacher uh, who was promoted to being a school principal. And he was great at developing relationships with students in the classroom. Um, when he became a school principal, somehow that was not happening. He was having a hard time motivating his team, engaging with the team. The team was losing morale. Mm. And we looked at his scores, and it turns out that he had a combination of scores that when combined, like they have to be at a certain level, but when combined, they lead to micromanagement. Interesting. So he was, um, as a leader, kind of suffocating the team and not letting them really flourish and not really trusting them to be able to do their work. Um, so it was interesting that that micromanagement style worked really well for him in the classroom, especially with high school students. Sure. Um, but not so well when he was trying to manage people and adults, yeah, right? And adults, right. Interesting. So that was a big eye opener for him. Um, and it just kind of really gave him something to really pay attention to and mm -hmm. work with, engage the team in a, in a conversation about, okay, so how, how do I turn this around? What is sure. the shift we need to make here? That's so powerful. I think about how many times I've been in conversations with edu educators who are trying to make gut level decisions. Yes. Uh, what's going to make somebody successful or why they're not successful or um, why they're having trouble in certain areas and having that actual data <laughs> again to, to yeah. explain it, not just to prove it, but to explain the like ingredients that go into making that 
adult working relationship side more challenging. Um, seems like such yeah. a powerful and impactful thing for for schools, and then ultimately to, for us um, figuring out what's best for kids. Also. Yes. Oh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, that's um, something that I find very uh, rewarding about my work with school clients is kind of the sense that in some way I'm, I'm impacting the students' lives. Ultimately, it's going to have an impact on how, how well, you know, how effective the teachers are, how effective the leaders are, and it's going right. to have an impact on students as well. That's what it's all about at the end of the day, right? <laughs> that is awesome. so true. Cool. Well, I um, am so excited to be able to uh, offer your services in the Workplace Big Five assessment to folks that I get to work with, too. Um, again, people can opt to just have the assessment or they can opt to do the assessments um, and continue to do coaching with me. And I yes. should opt to do the assessments and get the uh, uh, reports and have the 90 minute session with Monica or to s separately add to that getting ongoing coaching with me. Um, mm -hmm. I have more information about this on my website at edplusconsulting.com. As I share this out, um, I'll also make sure we share out your contact information, Monica, for people who are interested in getting in touch with you either for in their individual needs or for their organizational needs too um and uh i look forward to your i was going to say your phone ringing off the hook but it's probably <laughs> your email <laughs> because i think again that this is um you know, i'm not not being biased in saying this <laughs> but really helpful to organizations in general we you know sometimes forget that schools and other organizations that are serving schools um, and students are at their very core organizations and need yes. great practices like, like this to help them thrive and, and succeed. Oh yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. I'm excited to be a partner in what you're doing too. And um, yes, looking forward to connecting with anyone who uh, who was in the conversation or listening to the recording if you have any questions i'm always open and uh, happy to to have a conversation with you and understand what your challenges are or how you want to use the assessment so excellent well and thanks for um everyone who listens to this and for the questions that came in to me today on the chat <laughs> line too um and look forward to our next reform conversations coming up soon Thanks so much. Thank you, Lydia. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.